I was sitting with my back to the seawall. The kid walked by, bang, he was hit in the head, down. Because if anybody walked on the beach, generally shoulders and head were exposed. We thought that was unusual, weren't really concerned too much with that one. And then all of a sudden, a second one happened. We said, damn it all, there's a guy around here, we gotta get him. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. Well, I tell you, uh, I don't think my grandmother would have liked it because uh, my mother dated a Marine in World War I and uh, she didn't like that. Basically, when I got out of high school uh, in 1938, uh, it was the Depression and uh, everybody was having a hard time in jobs. And my father and I sat down and, and he was an engineer and, in the automobile business and, and uh, he thought the best thing to do would be to join the Navy because every capital ship uh, has practically everything in it that an average city does and that you would eventually could learn a trade in electrician or carpentry or sail making or plumbing or you know you just name it they have it and when you come out of there well at least you might have to be able to do a job so I thought about that and that made sense so I went down to the Navy recruiting office in, uh, in Boston which was the main office for all recruiting for the New England section and to all the New England states. And so they took me and I passed all our exams and they came out to the house, sent a CPO out to see what my mother and father were like and what the house was like and everything else. And then I said, when will you take me? And they said, well, it's relatively slow, but, but call us every month and we'll let you know. Another fellow and I bought a, uh, a secondhand Ford dump truck, the kind that you had to hand crank up. It didn't have any hydraulics to it. And his uh, father, had a big farm not far from uh, Boston, and he had dug up, dug up a huge amount of loam, which was very good for gardens. And so we took that truck and we sold the loam, we advertised it, and we sold it all over Boston and hand cranked the truck up, hand cranked it back down again. I kept going back and forth. Well, 11th or 12th month had gone by, and I went in there and I said, when are you going to take me? And they still couldn't give me an answer. And they still didn't tell me why, except they were slowing down. And they were only taking about five or six out of the whole of New England a month. The Army and the Navy were filled up to their full capacity. And nobody was getting out of the service because they had a roof over their heads, they had food, and they also had some money to send home. Uh, just out of a quim, on a quim, I, I had to go past the uh, Marine Corps recruiting office, because they were right alongside the Navy, to get the elevator. And I walked in the, in the door and I said, Sergeant, if uh, I decided I want to become a Marine, how long would it be before you took me? He said, do you want to leave Friday or two weeks from Friday? And on <clears throat> July 7th of 1939, I raised my hand and became a Marine forever. Even though some people may have thought it was a, a bad situation, the Marine Corps was small and you could do things in it that you couldn't do uh, uh, with the big organizations, the big army, the big navy, you know, in comparison. Marine Corps only had 18,000 people in it when I joined it. And uh, it was smaller than the city police force in New York. And yet that encompassed everybody that was aboard ship, overseas at, uh, at embassies or wherever, you know. I figured there was an opportunity there to really get someplace. And I knew what life aboard ship was like. I, coming from Gloucester, Massachusetts, I had a good friend whose father was uh, the head of the ice patrol. Several Christmases, he and I had put on uh, Coast Guard uniforms without the seal on the sleeve. And, uh, and we'd gone uh, aboard ship and, uh, and his ship, his father's ship, and his father threw us down the focusle and said, you take whatever that chief tells you to do and you do it and I don't know you. I didn't wait for things to happen. I went looking for them. I, I, I did this to train myself as much as anything else the way I got my training as a cameraman by going to uh, the March of Time was, was persistence paid off. I tried three times, I was turned down three times, but the third time I was turned down, it just so happened that the president had ordered in a lot of reserve officers and one of them coming into Navy public relations was a director at the March of Time. March of Time.
you know, how often is something like that going to happen? So consequently, I talked to him. He put me in touch with the producer uh, when he came to town. Uh, he let me take some film over to him at the hotel. Two days after I met the producer, the producer, in a very strange set of circumstances, and how he set up his school to have military in it, was that during World War I, he was a lieutenant aboard a Navy vessel, and the, his roommate, another officer, another lieutenant, was now at this time rear admiral in charge of naval personnel. So when Louis decided to set up the, start the school, he called up his old pal and said, look, the stuff I'm getting from these guys shows that they know how to hold a camera, how to, how to shoot it, and how to take care of it and everything else, but they don't know how to tell stories with it. So I want to set up a school of pictorial journalism, and you send me half a dozen chief, senior petty officers, whatever, and a couple of Marines, and I'll teach them in a six-month course. So the Admiral says, sure. He calls up the Marine Corps and says, I need two Marines to go to the school. And all the times I was being turned down, it was because the kids that were being selected to go were from this embryo photographic section that was just being created, and they were sending people they knew. They didn't know me. So it was logical. But if I hadn't had that lieutenant come in, who was a director at the March of Time, and he put me in touch with Louis de Rochemont, and de Rochemont was doing what he was doing because he was friends with a guy in World War I. <laughs> it's a real crazy circle. <clears throat> but that's how I got into the training. I went on a lot of, a lot of shoots, and, uh, and I learned a lot of things. We learned by osmosis because the, uh, all the camera crew were a union, of course, and uh, they didn't like the idea of us guys coming in there and learning all their tricks because they figured after the war we'd come and take their jobs away from them. And they were all up in the years. They'd been in World War I, some of them. In fact, two of the camera crews that I went with, the cameramen, had been hired by the Army. They set up a French touring car with the top down and taken out the back seat effort and everything and put a platform in it and put a camera on there on tripod, and these guys would drive around the war front. <laughs> Through the camera, yeah. So they had experience, and they knew what they were talking about. What you had to do in graduation, you take 100 feet of film, which went through the camera at 90 feet a minute, into New York, find a subject, and tell a story, and not edit it in, when you came home. It was edited in camera. And the capability of doing that story in 100 feet which ran through the camera in a minute's time, was the answer to your success. They liked the job that I did. Tarawa was the most important one, mainly because it was the first time. The Marine Staff Sergeant with the Expert Medal is 22-year-old Norman Hatch from Boston, Massachusetts. Sergeant Hatch went in with the first wave on the landing at Tarawa, armed with a pistol and a hand camera and brought back a film record of the fighting on that island that looks as though it had been taken through a front-line gun sight. The attack on Tarawa, according to the understanding of most of the military of the day, was that it couldn't be done because of what had happened to Churchill's uh, attempt to land troops at Gallipoli, British, Australian, New Zealanders, who got annihilated by German and Turkish big guns set up on a high elevation that ruined them when they came in. That's why, if you've heard of Anzac Day, that's why they have it, because it's in memorial to the men that were lost in, those, in that particular campaign. And of course, others now later as well, but it started because of that. I laid it out in my mind pretty much in advance on what I wanted to do or how it should go. As a staff sergeant on, on Tarawa, I was responsible for several other people as well, and I had to look out for their, their, their well-being as well as doing whatever shooting I was doing. Once the adrenaline hits in, once you're in a, in a boat and, or, or amphib tractor, whatever it may be, and you know you're going in, you have been trained to do a job, and that job comes when you hit the beach. You're either a mortarman or you're a rifleman or a machine gunner or you're a pilot or whatever it is. You know you can be shot, you know all that can happen, but you put it back in your mind. Yeah, I gotta do my job because if I do it, it's gonna upset what this guy's doing and what this guy's doing, you know? The leader of, of Taro, or the, the admiral who was in charge, the Japanese admiral, had made a wild comment about something like a thousand men couldn't take it in a million years or something like that. It was so well fortified. 
So there we were going in to do something that everybody said was impossible. And we did it in 76 hours. Now I'm going with a camera. Now that's the second part that's important. This is the first time that a complete battle had been covered in film, motion picture and still. You gotta remember on Tarawa, for a long time, I was the only motion picture cameraman on the beach because of those boats that I was telling you about that were shot up. They held them off, they didn't have them come in at night, and they held them off till the next day. Nobody, I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of Marines out there floating around all night long, getting sick and rocking and rolling, you know. In fact, Johnny or Urkel, uh, my friend, uh, got his camera damaged uh, by spray coming in, and he got it covered with all salt water, so, and he had no fresh water he could wash it off with, so he threw it overboard. And he, fortunately, he had a 16 millimeter color camera with him. None of those guys got in until about 10 o'clock the next morning. I was like a kid in a candy store. I had everything going on. But I could only be on one beach. I couldn't, there were three beachheads, and uh, Red Beach one, two, and three. And I was on three, and I just stayed on three. And we had the whole south end of the island to take care of. On the first day, I was sitting with my back to the seawall, loading up a camera and so forth and so on. A kid walked by, bang, he was hitting the head down. Because if anybody walked on the beach, their generally shoulders and head were exposed. We thought that was unusual, but we, we weren't really concerned too much with that one. And then all of a sudden, a second one happened. We said, damn it all, there's a guy around here. We got to get him and find him. So I had still cameraman alongside of me at that time, Obi Newcomb. And said, Obi, let's look over the seawall a little bit and see what we can find. Just as we looked over the seawall, this guy sends out a rifle out of a port of a conical uh, top of a tank, uh, one, of, one, one of their parts of their tanks that are buried in the sand, and he had a vent that he could open. And I'm sure that everybody thought that was secured because we had troops past it. He maybe, maybe infiltrated it or he well concealed himself when they were going by and they're looking in, what have you. So anyway, he was doing the sniping. Well, we call up some engineers and they, they dropped a couple of satchel bombs next to it and sent a flame, sent a flamethrower through it. And uh, we're watching that. Now we're two active cameramen and we're watching it. We haven't lifted a camera to do anything. And he comes out of that thing all on fire and he had he had belts of ammunition around him. They were all going off in the fire. And Obi and I looked at each other and we thought, well, Christ, we don't want to be hit by some crazy bullet flying around. And so we got down below the seawall level. But we could have shot the whole thing and didn't do it. One of the things that we did automatically with the IMO was to, uh, when you held it up, you're going to shoot. Or just flick the trigger for a second, just to be sure everything's running through. I did that when I picked the camera up. Nothing happened. Well, what the hell's going on here? So <clears throat> took the door open. I found out very quickly the emulsion had melted in the gate. Yeah, it was that hot, yeah. And, and, emulsion, and of course, it had congealed very nicely onto the gate itself and everything. So I had to spend a careful time cleaning that up, getting it out of there. But I rem reminded myself that I don't lay it down in the sun. Because I knew that if I needed a rifle, I could bend down and pick one up. The idea of the camera... Many times, guys on what we, you might call the front lines would see me up with them and they'd say, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, you don't have to be here. And I would say in as short a sentence as I could that I have to be here because the public needs to know what you're doing if, if the president is going to get any support. And in training, I would do that because they'd say, what the hell are you doing here? Why are you shooting us in the street? i say, well, it's all of the idea of keeping the public informed because if they are not, they won't be here in the in the factories. In fact, when I came home from Tarawa and went on the fourth war loan drive, the factories were slipping a, slipping a little bit because Tarawa was the first real battle they had ever seen. Up until that time, the army was fighting the tanks in, in the African desert, and you can't really do much of a film on, on that because it's all long distance. There was a battle, I think, in Sicily, but it wasn't didn't have much coverage on film, and so the public really did not know what war was like until they saw the film that we shot at Tarawa. And at that time, the president was viewing the film, and he had Bob Sherrod in, who always came back to be debriefed by Time Life after a battle, and then the president, who liked him and knew him because he'd been a correspondent at the White House, 
would ask him to come down so he could be, be debriefed by the president because he can't get up and get around. And so he asked, they, they talked about the film and Sharon said, yes, he'd seen the rough cut too. And he said, do you think we ought to leave those dead bodies in there floating like that and moving with the surf, you know, up and down? Sharon said, yes, because the public does not understand yet what these fighting guys are doing. And this is really the first film to show it. I understood that uh, that was that need because I had worked in Navy public relations for a good six months and I understood a great deal from what they were doing and, and how they were trying to get material out to the public. That was always in the back of my mind. I figured we were out there to document what was going on for a number of reasons. And one of them is historical, of course. They could do just like we do now. There, that stuff is sitting in the archives or some college has got a fix on it one way or the other. It goes for training. It goes for operational purposes. See, I trained with them when they, I went on the maneuvers with them. In fact, we actually did a maneuver en route to Tarawa. We stopped at Afadi, complete landing and everything. No weapons fired or anything like that, but just to be sure that traveling on ship that hadn't fouled us up anyway. On the third day, I was in the command post of Crows to see what the various officers had to say about what they were doing. The battalion executive officer, Bill Chamberlain, was telling what he was planning to do. There was a big sand blockhouse, quite large, which had held up a lot of the advance of ours along the waterfront down to get towards the southern end of the island. So they decided to negate that building one way or the other. He said to me after he got through, he says, uh, do you want to come and take, shoot pictures of it? And I said, sure. What else am I going to say? We sort of half crawl and half walk up to his CP and he gets in it and it's a shell hole and I've got Bill Kelleher, my assistant, with me. He calls in all of the people who he considers important, lieutenants and senior NCOs, and they plan on how they're going to attack this building. Then, just like in the World War I movies, you know, that they, we had uh, about thing, everybody's, you know, set their watches and made sure it was right because at 0900, we were going to go off and attack that thing. So at 0900 comes, he looks at me, said, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. It's dead silent on the battlefield because nobody's firing anything, either us or them. So he gets up and he stands there and he says, follow me. We ran, we got up there and it was climbing in that, in that sort of sandy uh, situation of difficulty, one foot up and you slide back two feet. But we got up to the top of it quite quickly. I'm still carrying the camera in my hand. We run across the other side to the other side. We look down, there's eight or nine Japanese Riga Sentai Marines looking at us. I look at him and I said, Major, where the hell is your rifle? He said, I gave it to, to one of the kids who lost theirs in the landing. I said, where's your pistol? He said, it doesn't work. I said, we better get the hell out of here. And that was all in nanoseconds, believe me. And I looked around, there wasn't a Marine in sight. Where the hell were the rest of the Marines? We were all by ourselves, the two of us, on top of the, uh, top of the world at, uh, at, uh, on Tarawa. We could see all over the island. We ran back down again. And as you know, there was a little uh, strong language given in the next meeting as to why those guys didn't. I, I never understood why they didn't come along. But then I, I photographed all the attacking of the thing and so forth and so on. Of course, as a cameraman, I was a free runner. I could go wherever I wanted to. There were no restrictions on me, no restrictions on what I shot. That was dependent on the pre higher brass later on. If they didn't like something, they could cut it out. But I would shoot it. I would shoot anything and everything. You flew by the seat of your pants somewhat. What we learned at the March of Time and storytelling, when I would see something happening, I would take a long shot, medium shot, and a close-up. Those basic three shots. And then if I needed to get in for a little bit more, closer, whatever, do that. But I established where I was. I showed what was happening. And then I went in why it was happening, you know. And that's the way I shot most of the time. Editors did whatever they did, wanted to do with it, you know. They could cut it apart. I never saw my film until it came out in a finished production. We had it set up very good in World War II and in Korea and in Vietnam. In my estimation, in my old job at the Pentagon, they let go of the responsibility of release to the local commands. The local commander is not aware necessarily, it's not in his jurisdiction to be aware of what the national effort is. That can only be determined by DOD. I, I recognize uh, the newer equipment that, you know, you can take your, something out of your pocket and take movies with it and so forth and so on is all over the battlefield. 
but I still have not seen much of anything shot by the military. Now, in World War II, about 92% of all the film that the public saw was shot by the military. I have seen very little film shot by the military. How do we keep the public informed? The money coming to the Department of Defense for Public Affairs in the last wording of the order out of the government says two things. This will not be used to, to propagandize, and it also will be used to advise and keep the public informed of what the Department of Defense is doing. The Army has a unit down in Atlanta. You can go to it on a website and you can pick up everything that comes in every day, either written, still photo, or TV. They edit their material out there for a minute and a half, we'll say, for a television time. That will be airlifted into Atlanta. Atlanta posted up on the board as to when it came in and what it is, and you as an editor can go to that and select it and take it off and run it if you want or put it in and put it in with some of your own material. But I don't know how much of that has been done. Nobody knows what happens to all the film the guy shot or tape or video or whatever it may be. Between that edit for that minute and a half, where the hell is the rest of the film? I'm worried about that because that's history.